I have pigtails today Cause I don't give a fuck Hey guys, it's Wyndham And I'm back for Video Wednesdays But anyway, I had some announcements first of all Like before we kind of got started on everything First of all, sometimes you just get bored and when you get bored, you just need to, like, shave your head. Um, also, the camera woman is officially out. It came out today. And I'm gonna put a link to it down below. And I'm really excited because I got to act in it with my buddy Nathan Nicolau. And he, he's awesome. But today, we are talking about Metropolis. Oh. <laughs> Not even just Metropolis. We are talking about the complete Metropolis, which is like old school and two and a half hours long. I don't know what's up with me in doing these really long movies that take forever to get through. It took me like four hours to get through this movie just because I kept having to deposit like to go get food. Because I like food. So first of all, this movie is from 1927. I really wanted to go back. I think the earliest one that I had done was probably The Godfather, um, made in 1970. Um, I think that's the earliest that I've gone back. I'm trying to remember. Uh, but I wanted to go like really old school, and I wanted to go um, back, 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 and get one of the earliest films that is on this list. And Metropolis is on there. I mean, come on, it's a silent film, which. To me, it is incredible. I love silent films. I think one of my favorite silent films that I've ever seen is The Scarlet Letter. So anyway, this was from like 1927, and it's German expressionistic, but then it's also science fiction. So it's kind of tying these two things together and making this story that is kind of mind-blowing for its time, if you really think about it. And I think that's why it's on this list. I mean, it was the first feature-length drama of this genre, like, for its time. First ever. And it was directed by Fritz Lang. Fritz Long, I'm not really sure how you pronounce it in German. But he actually wrote the screenplay with his wife, which I just think is really cool. It's not just that he directed it, but he also wrote it. So he was able to really understand the vision that he had from the beginning and fulfill it to its completion, which I just think is beautiful. I think it's beautiful when a director is able to write a story to him or herself and then bring it to fruition. Which to me, it just it just communicates that it is complete in the way that it was supposed to be shown. Uh, which to me is really important. So whenever this movie debuted, it was met with mixed reviews. Partially because it was so ahead of its time. But people really weren't crazy about the length. Which I just think goes to show that the public opinion has been fickle since the dawn of time. And so Lang went and kind of cut it. Now, in the parts that he cut, the footage was actually lost. Now, years later, they recovered the footage. And how we got the complete Metropolis is they recovered the footage. They tried to restore the film to its original state as much as possible. Some of it couldn't be restored. And so the parts that couldn't be restored uh, are actually black and then they use typeface and words to kind of explain to the audience what's going on during those little lost bits that make the plot kind of makes sense. So the dialogue is in one font and uh, the plot being moved ahead by things that were deleted or lost scenes and lost footage kind of have a different font and that's how we get the complete metropolis. So this movie is set in 2026. That's where the story begins, as far as the plot. And, I mean, if our society looks like this in 11 years... Uh, there's this dystopian society that it looks like a utopia. It's kind of hidden the fact that it is a dystopian society. And there are definitely um, distinctions in class. And so the city is run... I don't know if his name is... Joe, Jaw, I don't know how you pronounce it, but Joe Friederson, and he runs the city kind of with an iron fist, and the wealthy are separated from the poor, and the poor have to work basically themselves to death to work these machines that 
power of the entire city. So it kind of opens and you see the workers working before you're taken to the beautiful land of the wealthy. And uh, Friederson has a song, uh, Frieder, Frieder Friederson, I guess. And Frieder is completely oblivious to the way that the city is run. And honestly, like what he does all day is he kind of chases after wealthy women and tries to kiss them and chases them around rocks. I don't know, that was, that was interesting to me. And it was kind of scandalous too, because there was a random topless woman wearing like a very uh, see-through shawl, but you could see through it. And I was like, this is, this is pretty scandalous, like for its day. I was like, oh my word. And um, yeah, that was kind of like, all right, there you go. There you go, Lang, you know, breaking boundaries. And uh, you see Frieder, and he's just kind of playing in these beautiful gardens. And all of a sudden, this woman comes out, and she's, you know, dressed in very plain clothing. And she has all these children. She just kind of randomly walks into the garden. And she just goes, look, it's your brothers with all these little poor, dirty children. And Frieder, oh, uh, honestly, everybody is kind of shocked. They don't really know what to do. And Frieder's, first of all, he's kind of like, what the heck is going on? But second of all, he's like, mm. I like that booty. I want some of that booty. He's kind of mesmerized by her. Uh, all the children are taken away, but Frieder tries to find her. And in trying to find her, he watches, he, he finds all these machines and all these workers. And you see this crazy scene, which to me, I was like, oh my gosh. He's watching these workers work, and they do all this stuff, and you see them kind of working these machines to open up this big gateway. And as the gateway is opened, you see all these workers fall, like they're hit by these explosions, and they're gravely injured, or they're killed, and they just kind of crash to the ground, and Frieder is just like, oh my gosh, and he's trying to help them, but he doesn't know how. Now Frieder goes to go tell his father, his father isn't really surprised, Frieder fires his assistant, and uh, his father is disturbed by how much Frieder cares, and so Joe Friederson sends a man called the Thin Man to watch over Frieder and look after him. Now, Frieder finds this man who is working basically to the point of exhaustion where he's falling over. And so Frieder says, let's change places. And this man's name is Gregory. And he goes, let's change places. You go take care of my duties and I'm going to basically do your work. And he kind of works himself to the point of exhaustion. And, um, Gregory kind of goes, and instead of doing what he's supposed to do, he kind of goes and has a little taste of the nightlife, basically. And Frieder works himself to exhaustion, but then finds a, a map in his pocket. Now, Friederson is very much aware of the workers having these maps, and so Friederson takes them to this man who's an inventor, and we meet Rodwang for the first time. And Rodwang was in love with this woman named Hell, but Hell denied him and married Friederson, and Hell was actually Frieder's mother, and died giving birth to Frieder. And so Rodwang is in the middle of building this bionic woman to kind of replace Hell. And it's a really cool robot scene with the bionic woman, <laughs> basically. And um, so Friederson and Rodwang. So Friederson shows Rotwang after he's shown the bionic woman. He gives the map to Rotwang, and so the two go down into the catacombs. And they find Frieda there, and Maria, the woman. So he's building this bionic woman to try to resurrect to try to resurrect Hell, basically. And they, but anyway, Rotwang and Friederson follow the maps. And they also find Frieder, and they are listening to this woman named Maria. And Maria is the woman that brought all the children down to the wealthy garden, saying, look, these are our brothers. Now, Maria kind of prophesies, prophesies, blah, blah, blah. Now, Maria prophesies the coming of a mediator that's going to unite the two classes. Frieder hears this. He's inspired by this, and he decides to declare his love for her because he decides that he wants to be the mediator. Now, Friederson, having seen the bionic woman, tells Rotwang, I want 
this robot to have Maria's likeness because I want her to, <laughs> Friederson basically wants her to lose her credibility among the workers because Friederson doesn't want anybody to be united and he certainly doesn't want it to be done in the name of peace. So Rotwing kidnaps Maria. Now, Frieder goes to the cathedral because they were supposed to meet up, but Maria's kidnapped. And in the meantime, Frieder hears uh, a priest, like a monk, speaking on uh, the Whore of Babylon and the Seven Deadly Sins, and he's kind of like, oh no, have mercy on Maria. Now, uh, the inventor basically steals Maria's essence in this weird scene where you think that she's killed. And he steals Maria's essence and transforms the bionic machine, machine woman, machine man, into Maria's likeness and sends her out into the city. And she starts having men murder for her because they're lusting after her so much. And Frieder doesn't know all of this and Frieder is just heartbroken. Now all the workers are following the false Maria because they were following her beforehand because she was a leader and kind of getting people to rise up and be excited about the change in social status. And they destroy the heart machine, unaware of what it could do to the entire city. Now, after they destroy the heart machine in the middle of the city, the city starts to flood, just because it's necessary for the city to run properly. The city kind of breaks. And um, the real Maria, has broken free and the real Maria starts gathering children trying to save them. Now Rotwang thinks that Maria is hell and is trying to find her. People discover that the false Maria is a false Maria and they decide to burn her at the stake not realizing that she's a robot. So they tie her up to a stake and they start to burn her. While Rotwang is chasing after the real Maria trying to seduce her basically <laughs> and Frieder doesn't understand that the Maria at the stake is the false Maria and Frieder starts freaking out. And as the city is kind of falling apart, Rotwang chases Maria all over this cathedral, eventually falls to his death. Frieder realizes that the, well kind of everybody realizes that the Maria burning at the stake is not real, that she's a machine. And on the steps of this cathedral, as the real Maria kind of descends, Frieder takes on his position as mediator and there's this line that's used consistently throughout the movie that the mediator between the head and the hands is the heart and so Frieder kind of becomes that mediator and that's basically the end of the story is as the city's being destroyed Frieder decides hey I'm gonna be your mediator I'm gonna be the savior of the city and it's over two and a half hours Plot isn't really complicated, plot is just kind of long, and because it's done in the style of a silent film, a lot of the acting is definitely overdone. I mean, that was the style, that's how people acted back in the day, because they had to be able to communicate things without using any words. So I, I kind of like that though. I like, I like seeing how far film has come and how far acting has come and people being able to communicate certain emotions through film. And um, so casting, I can't really complain anything about casting. Got Gustav Froelich as Frieder, excellent. Bridget Helm as Maria and, and her robot double. So I personally think that she did the best job because she had to portray two different characters. She was Sweet Maria, but she also played this weird, creepy robot with a droopy eyelid. Alfred Abel as Joe Friederson. Rudolph Rogue as Rotwing the Scientist. And, I mean, there's several other people, but for me, those were, like, the most important people for those four characters. And like I said, I think that they did an excellent job, especially Bridget. Originally, the screenplay was written because it was kind of being adapted from the idea of a novel, and the novel is kind of written with the idea of being made into a film. 
and inspired by Shelley and H.G. Wells. And now I think something that was interesting was uh, Lang kind of had no mercy. And pretty sure this was like back in the day before we had actors unions, you know, like we didn't have SAG and all that kind of stuff. And so Lang really worked his, his actors way too hard. Uh, they were day like, like when the city was flooding the, the actor that played Maria, Bridget, and all these children had to work for 14 days straight on the scene of the flooding, working in pools, specifically kept at low temperatures on purpose. So Lang was a little cuckoo and uh, kind of worked his actors to the bone. And it's been said that he kind of had no mercy and he would do continuous retakes and reshoots over and over and over again. Now, scoring was done by Gottfried Hubbards, and of course, it being a silent film, scoring was ridiculously important. And personally, I felt like the scoring was perfect. I feel like it com completely communicated everything that it needed to communicate, because in a way, scoring communicates, it's like the scoring, as well as the actors, their movement, communicate the dialogue before we're given the dialogue. So I personally felt that scoring was on point, but it was brilliant. But anyway, by the end of it, I will say I had a problem uh, with how long it was, even though I definitely appreciated the fact that I got to see the complete version, which I just think is really cool. Um, broke so many barriers, of course. It was amazing, and me being the nerd that I am, love silent films. So overall, it was really good. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Um, definitely being something that I recommend to people that are big film buffs to watch. And yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, did I necessarily want more by the end? No, I'm, I'm good. I didn't really want more. A lot of times I say, I wanted more and the plot didn't satisfy me. No, I was good. I, I didn't need any more. I could have I could have done with less, even though I'm very grateful for what I was given. So yeah, overall 8 out of 10. And it was definitely a journey, it was definitely an experience, something that I really enjoyed. And yeah. Um, so, yeah. Check out the camera woman, link down below. And I'm gonna have the quiz down below. Follow me on social media. Uh, so, anyway, it's Wyndham, you are a filthy casual. And I'll see you guys next time, hopefully with another 250 coming up. Anyway.